This video goes through examples of series solutions at ordinary points. I'll start with a pretty simple equation, y double prime plus y equals zero. We've already seen this equation a couple of times. Its solutions are sine and cosine. But let me show you how the series method works here, how it constructs the series for sine and cosine out of the DE. I'll choose zero as the center point. The coefficients here are p equals zero and q equals one. Both are constant, so they are analytic everywhere. Zero is the nicest center point for Taylor series, so I'll choose it out of convenience. Then I write down a generic series with center point zero but unknown coefficient cn. My goal is to figure out what these cn should be. Then I calculate the first two derivatives of the series. Series are great since I can differentiate term by term, and all the derivatives are just power rules. Note that the starting point increases, or the starting index rather, increases with each time, since each derivative destroys a constant term in the series. Then I put these in the differential equation. There is no first derivative in this DE, but I replace y double prime and y by the series that I've just calculated. To try and solve for cn, I'm going to want to combine the sums into one sum. To do that, I need the same starting point for the sum. So the first operation here is a shift on the index of the sum. The first sum starts at 2, but I want it to start at 0. To make this change, I subtract 2 from the starting index, 2 to 0. To balance this and preserve the sum, I need to add 2 to the index inside the sum. n becomes n plus 2, n minus 1 becomes n plus 1, n minus 2 becomes n. I add 2 to every place n shows up inside the sum. The top bound infinity doesn't change. Counting to infinity is the same regardless of where I start. Well, then I have two series with the same bounds and the same powers of t. I can combine them. Finally, I have zero on the other side of the equation. I can do something a bit silly. I can write zero as a series. As a series, it's just zero times every power of t, since that all adds up to zero. Now I have an equation of series. Here is where a very important series fact comes into play. Two series are the same only if their coefficients are the same. So instead of writing one equation for series, I get an equation for each coefficient, one equation for each n. Yet, this is now infinitely many equations, but they do have a pattern. For each n, this statement is true about the coefficients. I can solve for the higher number coefficient. If I do, I get that the n plus tooth or n plus second coefficient is equal to the negative of the n coefficient divided by n plus 1 times n plus 2. This is a recurrence relation. The elements cn are a sequence of numbers. A recurrence relation is a way to define a sequence. This is a second order recurrence relation. Each coefficient is determined by the coefficient 2 before it in the series. This means if I know the first two coefficients, then I can calculate all the other coefficients used in the recurrence relation. So figuring out the recurrence relation and knowing the first two values will determine the series coefficients, hence the series, hence the solution to the DE. And this is what always happens with series solution. I turn a DE, which is a very hard problem, into a recurrence relation, which is still a tricky problem, but hopefully not as hard. What I would like to do is solve the recurrence relation. Solving a recurrence relation means finding an exact equation for the terms. The recurrence relation only tells each number in terms of the previous numbers. I'd like to know the numbers directly. Solving recurrence relations is, in itself, an interesting piece of mathematics. But for our purposes, we'll just do the most basic version of solving recurrence relations in this course. I need the first two values. The recurrence relation doesn't tell me where to start. These two values conveniently turn out to be exactly the initial conditions of the equation. c0 is the starting position, and c1 is the starting velocity. I'll start with an offset, c0 equals 1, so that think of a pendulum pulled out one unit of distance, but no initial velocity, c1 equals 0. If the initial conditions were unknown, I would leave these as unknowns. But if there are initial conditions given, it's pretty convenient that I get to work them into the series solution at an early point instead of figuring them out afterwards, as we've done before. Then I start to calculate a bunch of coefficients. I want to describe the sequence. 
To do this, I'm just going to write down a bunch of terms and then try to identify a pattern. There are more sophisticated ways to solve recurrence relations, but this will do for our purposes. So here are the calculations of the first 10 or so terms. For each, I just look at the term two previous, multiply by negative one, and divide by the right two numbers. C2 will be work out to negative one half, since C0 was one, and I divide by one and two. C3 will be zero, since C1 was zero. C4 will be one over 24, which I'll write one over two times three times four, and so on. In each step, I'm just using the recurrence relation, applying the formula. Now look at what I get. The odd terms are zero, and I can reasonably argue that all the odd terms will be zero off to infinity. The even terms are more complicated. Their numerators alternate between one and negative one. In the denominators in each step, I multiply by two nor more numbers, but what I'm doing there is I'm building a factorial. And this is the reason I wrote 24 as two times three times four, in order to see the pattern of multiplication. This way of writing multiplication will often be useful to identify patterns. From my observations, I can write down a pattern. The odd terms are zero. To indicate the odd terms, I'll write C2n plus one. For any index n, this will give the next odd number. Likewise, I'll write C2n for the even numbers. The even terms have an alternating sign in the numerator. Negative one to the n is the way to write this sign. And starting with n equals zero means that this will be positive, which does fit the pattern. Then the factorial in the denominator matches the index. C2 has two factorial, C4 has four factorial, C6 has six factorial, so C2n will have two n factorial in the denominator. These are closed form solutions for the coefficients of the Taylor series. I've solved the recurrence relation just by writing down terms and looking for patterns. Well, then I can write the final solutions by putting these into the Taylor series. The odd terms are all zero, so I'll not include them. For each even coefficient, I match it to the same even power. C to the 2n matches to t to the 2n. This is the Taylor series. And if you check your reference forms, this is precisely the series for cosine, which solved the system with this initial condition. I have reconstructed the series for cosine from the information in the DE. This is how solving by series works. By solving a recurrence relation, I get a series that describes a function that solves the CE, DE. In this way, in this case, I recognize the series as a known function cosine, but that may not happen in general. The series might be a new function entirely, but I'll at least have a series to describe it. A series is a function, so it is a solution to the DE, even if I would have to work hard to sort of figure out the properties of the new function defined by a series. For a second example, I'll only make a small change, changing Q from to T instead of just constant one. In terms of harmonic motion, this is saying that the stiffness of the spring is linearly increasing over time. The coefficients are analytic any, everywhere, so I can choose any center point. I'll choose zero. Here is the generic series and its derivatives. I'll put those into the differential equation. Then I'll take this T inside the second series, adding one to the exponent, for another power of t. Here is the result. This is the, then there's series algebra that I need to work with to try and deal with this expression. I have a series that starts at two and one that starts at zero. In the previous example, shifting the series was enough. I didn't talk about it very much at the time, but the reason that it worked out well was because the powers of t also matched up after the shift. To make all this work, two things need to match. The series needs to start at the same point, and the exponents of t need to be the same. So here I need to do a bit more series manipulation to make it all work. In general, I'll try to match the powers of t first. Here I can do this by shifting both series, shifting the first series up by 2 and the second down by 1. That adjusts the power of t to be t to the n for both series. Then, after matching the powers of t, I'll work on matching the starting index. This is the right order of adjustments. If you match the starting index first, then working on matching the power of t might mess it up. So I need to match the starting index, but I can't shift anymore since that would mess up the powers of t. So instead, I pull out terms. 
I can pull out terms of a series, that's a valid thing to do, and I'm gonna pull out the first term from the first series. N equals zero gives C zero times two times one, so two C two. Then the remaining piece starts at N equals one. Now the series are evenly matched, same starting index and same power of T, and I can combine them into one. Now that I have a series, I can move to look at the recurrence relation for the coefficients. As before, C0 and C1 will be unknown, but since I had to pull out C2, and it is the only constant term on the right, the left is still zero, which means that C2 has to be zero. Well, then I'll look at the equation for the coefficients of t to the n and set it equal to zero as well. By solving for C n plus two, I get a recurrence relation. To make this recurrence relation a bit easier to read, I'll shift everything up by one, adding one to each n. This still encodes the same relationship, but makes the base cn, which is a little bit more conventional. So this is the recurrence relation I need to solve. I'll start by calculating terms. c0 and c1 are unknowns from the initial condition, which I'll leave as unknowns in this one, and c2 is zero. Then c3 is negative c0 over three times two, C4 is negative C1 over four times three, and C5 is negative C2 over five times four, which is zero since C2 is zero. And again, I will be leaving C1 and C0 as unknowns all the way through. I keep calculating coefficients. Here are the next six calculations applying the recurrence relation. Every third term is zero, two, five, eight, 11. The others are, have alternating signs with factorial-like denominators but they aren't complete factorials since they skip every third number in the multiplications. So what do I observe? All the terms that are two more than a multiple of three, two, five, eight, 11, and so on, are all zero. All the multiples of three relate back to C naught with alternating signs and factorial-like denominators. And likewise, all the terms that are one more than a multiple of three relate back to C one, also with alternating numerators and factorial-like denominators. This is the pattern I observe. For the multiples of three, the three n are multiples of C naught. They alternate in signs starting with positive, so I'll write negative one to the n. If I fill in the missing terms in the denominator to make a factorial, I need one times four times seven up to three n minus two. It's a complicated pattern, but all of these multiples of three I calculated all the way up to 12 do fit this pattern. For the terms indexed 1 plus a multiple of 3, 3n plus 1, this is similar. They're all multiples of c1, they alternate starting with positive, and again I can fill in the missing pieces to make a factorial and then repeat those factors in the numerator to essentially cancel them off to get the original expressions. This is the result that I get. And finally, all terms that are indexed 2 plus a multiple of 3 are 0. I need to put this into a series. I can group the C0 and C1 terms together, and I put the patterns in using t to the 3n and t to the 3n plus 1 for the multiples of 3 and 1 plus the multiples of 3. The way I wrote the pattern doesn't work for t equals 0 because of the negatives in the numerator, so I'll just write 1 and t out in front and then start with n equals 1 for the rest of the series. This is a complete solution. C0 and C1 are parameters, and I get two linearly independent functions of t. This was a more complicated example to be sure, and working with recurrence relation is a skill that takes a lot of practice, but it did produce a solution. Unlike the first example, these are likely entirely new functions. I don't recognize them, and it's very unlikely that they happen to be elementary functions. One of the great advantages of series solutions is that they can construct new functions when elementary functions don't work. They suddenly expand the breadth of functions, at least within the scope of analytic functions, of functions that can be represented.